Tuesday. I don't think um, that much of what I want to talk about will really have any practical application to, uh, uh, to resistant switching. Um, but I, I might worry um, because what I want to talk about is a series of vignettes, um, which is about how complicated life can get when you have competing phases. And this is really what this is about, because I've um, had a number of talks, particularly today, about rather interesting things about switching of hopefully simple systems from metal to insulator. And, that. and um, what I want to talk about actually are um, some more complicated variants of that. Um, and in particular, I spend a lot of my time um, talking about magnets. Um, just right at the start, because I won't get to the end, um, I'll uh, thank some of my, my colleagues for this. So the work that I'm talking about with magnets is done uh, largely actually with a student, Jack Norwood, and Maria Calderon, and Louise Gray from Madrid. And I've also collaborated a lot on shaky data from my uh, colleague, Neil Nackler, um, uh, experimental group uh, working in this, and his students, James Lowe and Susan Cox. Um, I'm also going to talk about something completely different, namely heavy fermion material, cerium cobalt indium 5 and this is worked up with collaborators in Athens, George Sparrow and Jones, and some students. And there's sort of a last vignette, which is all of that classical physics is worked up um, with, a, with another student in Cambridge and then a postdoc in Princeton. Um, so, uh, um, we're used to the idea of um, uh, soft condensed matter. And I think, if you like, resistive switching and pliability and plasticity <coughs> is in many ways an idea of trying to take some of the ideas and concepts and things that one has got used to uh, in the context of something like a liquid crystal, where we're used to the idea that we can apply weak external forces and change the physical properties of things uh, to solids. Now, um, I'll point out, for example, that for a long time, we've known that you can create inhomogeneous structures in solids. Um, in fact, this is one. This is a charge density wave material. This is tantalum disolenide. Um, this is a material which has a structural instability that produces a, uh, a, a, a periodic charge density modulation, that periodic charge density produces actually lines of uh, dislocations in the, uh, in the charge density, and these can end in singular points, which are vortices, and this is actually not too different um, philosophically from that, except the fact that this is an optical picture, this is TEM, this length scale is, is a few hundred microns, um, and this length scale is a few thousand angstroms. But nonetheless, we've known for a long time that you can take these charge ordered structures and manipulate them and play with them um, and, and, and change the patterns. And one of the ones that I do want to talk about um, is, uh, is a sort of classic um, uh, manganite lanthanum calcium manganese oxide, where what you're looking at here is a picture um, on a length scale of, a, of 100 nanometers, and this scale of the white dots here around 30 nanometers are charge ordered uh, uh, insulating pieces of lanthanum calcium magnetite, and the black bits which are in between are actually ferromagnetic metal. And so this is stuff which actually contains in something which is nominally chemically homogeneous two phases. And we've known for a long time that there are all kinds of things that you can do to manipulate one phase into the other, including applying electric fields and uh, shining light on it, applying stress. Um, and so this has long been you know, one of the systems that people have looked to for, for models of, I suppose, what we'll call generically mechanistic effects. Um, so uh, and, and those effects arise from competing phases. And I'm going to dissect that, actually, in a particular chemical composition for the lanthanum and calcium manganite. Um, and that will be the first part of my story, and that will actually take up most of the talk. Um, and, but the, the main point is here, actually, is that you think you have two phases. Um, you think you have a competition between one phase and another, and that the system is going to make a choice between phase one and phase two. Uh, but sometimes when I'm presented with a choice, it instead makes a compromise. And the compromise it can make, actually, is to construct a new long-period 
periodic mixture of phase one and phase two, which is itself a separate thermodynamic phase. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. And how about, in some sense, some of those things are in fact inevitable from the structure of the theory. Um, uh, as another example of that, this is a completely different system. This is serum cobalt indium 5. Serum cobalt indium 5 is a material which is very near a, an antiferromagnetic instability. It's a heavy fermion compound. It's a superconductor. It's probably a D wave superconductor. Um, and uh, it, um, but nonetheless, there's, there's some uh, cohabitation and proximity between the single superconductor phase and the spin density wave. And it turns out that this system can be manipulated by a magnetic field to generate a state which is either this or something which is actually a mixture of three phases, namely single superconductor and spin density weight and a triplet superconductor, and they all come together. And it turns out that these things can only exist if you have all of them, or you can just have one of them. And so you have a very strange phase diagram here where you have a magnet which appears only because the system is superconductor. Usually, magnetism and superconductivity don't like each other. But it seems here that there is an example, it's our argument for this example, of, of actually <coughs> a system um, which is allowed to be an for a magnet because it's superconducting and not otherwise. Um, and then I'll make some odd remarks which are sort of completely parenthetical about, uh, um, which, is, which came about really because of looking at data on systems like this where you have phases mixed up which are all to do with essentially a classical problem alluded to earlier actually by Dmitry Bazov about if you have a composite medium of phase one and phase two, what are the average properties of that? And you can get some odd results. Um, manganites. Um, many of you will know this. I'll, I'll do this very briefly. The history of manganites, of course, goes back a long time to the 50s, uh, but was resurrected in the mid-90s with the discovery of what became called colossal magnetoresistance. But this is nothing more um, than uh, systems like uh, lanthanum manganite uh, doped with holes by replacing lanthanum by strontium, whereby you go from a material which is resistivity versus temperature on a log scale, which is a very sound insulator, to something which has a transition temperature here, Mark TC, which is actually ferromagnetism, and into a low temperature phase, which is a metal. And as you can see, there's a correlation here between there being metallic ferromagnetism and sort of a bad metal phase above TC. And not surprisingly, then, if you apply a magnetic field in the vicinity of this transition, you can change the resistivity a lot. Actually, this isn't very much. There are ways of making this effect very, very much bigger. Uh, but nonetheless, um, this was of interest for a while as the possibility of, uh, of having a very large magnetoresistant effect that one you could use one way or the other. I shan't really be concerned about it. The other thing, however, buried in the phase diagram of these materials are things like this. This is lanthanum calcium manganite uh, with a lot of calcium in it. And this is an electron micrograph, a TEM image. Um, and these lines that you can see um, are, in fact, lines of atoms showing some kind of contrast. And this, contra and this is actually an insulating phase. And this contrast was interpreted and more or less correctly, as a stripes um, charge localization of lines of atoms. And so this is a mixture of normally manganese 3 plus and normally manganese 4 plus. And if you orbitally and charge order the system so that some of the electrons are in 3 plus states, some of the atoms are in 3 plus states, and some are in 4 plus states, you can use a pattern, which looks just like this. So this, um, uh, uh, and the physics of manganite is largely associated with a competition between this kind of charge ordering instability, which is intrinsically associated with occupying different orbital levels in here, and in fact is driven by the Antella light physics, or the other side of things where if the electrons delocalize, that tends to produce ferromagnetism. Um, and in, in principle, we understand the moving parts of that very well. But the details turn out to be quite complicated. And loosely, very loosely, um, one has a phase diagram for manganites that to a theorist looks something like this. Um, that you, temperature is up on this axis, and generically I put in some kind of electron-phonon coupling 
along this axis, uh, where if the electron photon coupling is weak, I have only magnetic interactions, and I get a transition from a paramagnetic metal to a ferromagnetic metal in the usual way. Whereas if the coupling to the lattice gets big, eventually I get these charge ordered phases which exist out here. And the real physics of manganites is, is uh, of, of so called fossil magnetic resistance is in fact associated not with this phase or this phase, but actually the phase which exists up here. Because if you take something with charge ordering correlations and you melt it, it produces a liquid which has strong polaronic physics. And so up here, this system re remembers that it really is joined up to a solid, um, whereas in the ferromagnet, the electrons are much more effectively delocalized. So this is a good metal, this is a rather bad metal, and in regions around here, you can get very large uh, magnetoresistant effects as you go out of this liquid phase, which is actually a rather bad metal, into the ferromagnetic phase, which is quite a good one. This is a parameter which gets tuned in all kinds of ways. You can tune it by changing the rare earth in these compounds, uh, by doping, of course, by the effect of magnetic field, by elastic strain, by a whole host of other things. Um, and most of the interesting magnetites are sort of aligned around here, where that tuning parameter is at its best. And the way you see it, of course, is if you come down here with weak lattice coupling, you just see the metal, the metal behavior you come down here, when you're into a first order region, you will actually see a big resistance uh, jump um, with some hysteresis, and somewhere in the middle you'll see the kind of curves that I showed you before. Um, and you know, that's sometimes more or less what you can already see in this data going from this regime uh, to that one up there. Um, but the question that gets asked, that has to get asked here, is if you're sitting in the middle here, what really happens? Two, um, all kinds of words are used. You talk about phase separation and phase coexistence. That sort of means the same thing, although, of course, there's an implication that things either like each other or hate each other. Um, there's a lot of hysteretic effects, um, and there's been a great deal of work done on these systems in the uh, past few years. Um, I want to begin, however, by thinking about the solid phases. And in fact, I'm not going to talk, as I say, particularly about CMR at all. Um, to begin with this picture I showed you, and to ask what it really means. Um, this has some kind of short length scale charge order, which you see in the so-called strike phases, and it's obvious that they really are strike. Uh, and what does that mean? Um, and let me begin with a sort of a cartoon of the structures to explain how it's natural to think about it. If you begin with lantern of manganese, um, uh, that is manganese 3 plus. Manganese 3 plus has one electron sitting in an EG orbital, which can typically point out this way or that way, the way that I joined it. Um, and when it points in a particular direction, it moves the oxygens, which are at the edge of the octahedron. This is a slice through a perovskite structure. Um, and so if the orbital's occupied this way, and then this way, and then that way, you get this kind of herringbone pattern, uh, which in fact describes quite well the structure of lanthanum and manganese oxide, and was understood as such in the 50s. Um, this, uh, if you dope this material to 50-50 um, lanthanum and calcium, um, then if you just think if you were an engineer, this is the structure that you would make for that, because now you've got 3 plus and 4 plus. The manganese 4, um, the man the manganese four doesn't have this orbital occupied, and therefore it's much smaller, and likes to be in a sort of cubic environment. And the way you stack all of these things up is to line them along in sheets like this, alternate rows of 3 plus and 4 plus. And um, this phase actually will be Naturally, it turns out, of course, an insulator, as we look one, but this will be an antiferromagnet, and it produces what's called the CE phase of the antiferromagnetism. And one can understand that quite readily. Um, so that's what one expects to see. Um, so let's go looking for it. And of course, I, I already showed you a cartoon. Here now is a TEM image of precisely this doping, taken a long time ago, 1996. Um, and the image you can see here, and of course, because you have that doubling, that period doubling in here, 
you expect to see some extra diffraction spots. Here they are, this one there, one there, one there. Um, and that those diffraction spots are very naturally interpreted um, in terms of this structure of 3 plus, 4 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus, etc. Double period itself. That's what you see at low temperatures, and that's perfectly fine. An odd thing happens when you warm this up. Of course, when you warm up this charge ordered phase, eventually there should be some point where the charge <coughs> melts, and there will be a transition into, uh, into something where the average order goes away. And how does that ordering happen? Well, it happens in a rather surprising way. What actually happens, it happens by going incrementally. So these peaks here, which are exactly halfway between the two main drag peaks, are that way up until 120 Kelvin, then on warming, actually, they shift. Actually, the peak split, and it doubles. And it moves from an incommensurability of half to, well, that 0.1 is really 0.6 or 0.4. So these peaks split by an enormous amount. Um, so actually, the phase that you've got here um, it, it, um, it is, in fact, incommensurable. So this is a charge ordered period, but it's not the one you expect from the chemistry, it's actually something different. Um, there's hysteresis associated with this transition. The charge ordering disappears at around here. But there's something else which is surprising here, which is in this intermediate range here, um, it also seems to be weakly ferroic. Um, so uh, this is actually a much more complicated phase transition than one was expecting. Rather than just having antiferromagnetic and charge order disappearing in some transition, we go via a phase which is incommensurate and weakly ferromagnetic <coughs> into the normal phase. It's a normal thing to do. Um, uh, and um, so that's a sort of a surprise. And actually, these charge order phases systematically all do this. This is the wave vector of that peak. This is temperature. At low temperatures, you get the number that you would have expected on the basis of chemistry. At high temperatures, however, before the onset of charge order, it becomes incommensurate. The antiferromagnetism goes away. In places where it's measured, it tends to be ferromagnetic here. Another slight quirk, however, is that if the doping is greater than half, that's what happens. If the doping is less than half, um, uh, in cases where you still see charge order, the periodicity, however, is not equal to the doping, it's actually a half. So the wave vector has this dog's leg. It goes like 1 minus x, as you would expect at low temperatures, and it kicks. Um, so a number of oddities about this. So we have an unexpected incommensurability, there's weak ferromagnetism. Uh, there's this asymmetry near a doping of a half. Um, in the uh, uh, in, in the low dope phase, um, it's, you see uh, actually canted magnetism, again, being known for a very long time. Um, and while well, I didn't discuss that, actually this, this incommensurate phase has some uh, surprises in it too that I won't talk about. Um, so what to do when faced with that? I mean, of course, one could try doing microscopics, um, but it's very hard. Um, what I just want to argue, actually, is that there's a, there's a rather natural explanation on symmetry grounds. But to introduce that, I need to um, introduce you to a description of, um, of uh, incommensurate phases, which is really due to Bill McMillan from about 30 years ago. So the idea is that rather than thinking about charge order in terms of strikes, um, I'll pretend that I could really model it as just a sinusoidal modulation. It may not really be sinusoidal, it doesn't matter very much. It has a wave vector, which is the period. It will have an amplitude, but it also has a phase. And the idea of this phase, of course, is that if you have the phase of the wave, is associated with what the origin is. But if I allow the phase to be modulated as a function of space, then what I can do is I can shrink or stretch the wave to locally change its periodicity. Well, why would I want to do that? So if I want to model something which goes 3 plus 4 plus 3 plus 4 plus, what of course I would do is I would choose a wave vector, which is exactly one half of the reciprocal lattice vector, and the phase of say 0 just line up with these. So I get this red, blue, with min max. If I had an incommensurate wave which was just uniformly stretched, then of course the valence will be changing smoothly over here. This will be sitting up and down. 
And I would get that by choosing the same Q here, but having this phase to grow linearly in this, this position. And so this, so the actual wave vector here is big Q plus little Q. And I can, of course, do something in between, which is to make something which has so-called discommensurations in them to have the same average period as this, but to make it by having it locally locked, make a mistake, locally locked, make a mistake. And you can see that that kind of thing has a strike as sort of an extra four months. So what that means is um, I would end up with a picture with a phase would go with the staircase like this. And by the way, the minimal model from symmetry grounds, which gets you this, is actually a Hamiltonian which uh, couples the, uh, this density wave to the underlying lattice with a periodic potential, and then has an elastic term which wants to stretch it to its preserved wave vector. And a minimum of this Hamiltonian produces something that looks like that. And the shape of this curve, how well defined these peaks are, are associated with the relative magnitudes of these vectors. So but that's been used for a long time to describe models of charge density waves, um, and, it, and, it can, and it will do quite well as a, as a statistical mechanical model. Now, what happens if I have competing orders? So in particular, let's imagine that I have charge order with one ground state, competing order with, say, with magnetic order in another, um, and I could write down a Landau theory for both of these two, and then I need some coupling term. It is the coupling term and the relative minima of these two which determine which phase you get into. Um, so, you know, the natural thing, of course, is to have a free energy cost which doesn't like the two order parameters to coexist. So that's very natural. Um, so that has a positive term, that's a penalty, and so that will generally keep them apart. And if you just have this term in the Hamiltonian, in, in, in the Gibbs-Landau the, 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 the <coughs> you will get a first order transition between one phase and the other. If you ask what the next order term is, however, uh, the next order term is a term which couples gradients. And the leading term which couples gradients is in fact linear in gradient and quadratic in both order gradients. Um, the fact that such a linear gradient term is allowed by symmetry just means that stretching the chain and compressing the chain do not give rise to the same state. So in the absence of part of the whole symmetry of generic, you don't have that here. Um, this curve is there. I don't know what the sign of the coefficient is, but it doesn't matter. It actually has profound effects. It's a term which couples to gradients. So you remember that, that I originally had a term of my free energy for the charge order, which was grad phi minus q. So a term which is like this, is like shifting the Q vector from the one that you expected it to be to something which would then depend on this coefficient, which actually depends on n squared. Um, and if this, if this bare Q value is the thing you expect in terms of the charge order, just from chemistry, so this goes like half minus x with doping, and then I have this <coughs> thing there um, with a coefficient whose sign I don't know. But once you pick the sign, and let me assume the sign was positive. Then what you see is that it's possible to have this term for magnetization to cancel out this term from chemistry. So what I can do is that I can make the wave vector stable at a doping and a half, providing it's also magnetic. Or, and that's um, uh, basically what you see here, that this term actually drives the system away from the commensurate phase to an incommensurate phase that's also magnetic. And the other thing it does is that if I have a doping of less than a half, so that this is positive, and if D2 is positive, this term can cancel that, so I can keep it commensurate, which is what it likes to do, uh, by coexisting magnetism. So that produces that dog snake. Um, now there's no theory going in here. I mean, there's no numbers or anything like that. So you should try and fit to experiment crudely. And in a reasonable sense of parameters, we'll get things that look like the data. I can go through that in more detail. One doesn't have to tune very much. Um, 
Um, but you get a very complicated structure of phases. You get phases which are, you know, here's uh, magnetization, here's the incommensurability. You can have things which are ferromagnetic and incommensurate, ferromagnetic and commensurate, commensurate and non ferromagnetic, and whatever. And, and a lot of stuff um, which, which automatically happens. Um, now, the other thing it does is it plays very, it plays very interesting structure with the uh, with, with, um, with, with the uh, the parameters playing off against each other. So, for example, at a discommensuration, if I was in this charge ordered phase, so here's a discommensuration, this is the kink of the phase, it turns out that suppresses the charge order parameter and enhances the magnetization. Or, if I have a magnetic domain wall, at the magnetic domain wall, it provides a soft spot where charge order tends to be enhanced. And that latter one, for example, might explain things which are periodically reported, although are very difficult to nail down, uh, about the fact here is uh, you know, the standard um, uh, resistive switching curve uh, got by taking a junction here where I have uh, two domains um, of, uh, of magnetization of the plane, this way and that way, which I can flip, and I measure the resistivity along here, and you get a very large resistivity chunk associated with this which is quite a bit bigger than one would expect from simple grounds um, and undoubtedly would be the kind of number you might get if you were generating a soft spot here where you really uh, suppress the resistivity just by changing the magnetic order. But I say that this has been very difficult to control. Um, it's not easy to do this. Other things happen, for example, the things coupled to strain. I didn't mention strain very much. Um, this wave vector depends on the strain conditions of the sample. So this is a sample which has been uh, thinned and a piece cut out of it. So you're looking down on the top. These different colors, this is wave vector one, this is a different wave vector here. And so this is less strained from the substrate than this one. And you discover that the charge order decides to move to a different period. It's easy to move around. Uh, it may even be, actually, that this particular material um, you can move the whole stuff with a, uh, a magnetic, with an electric field. Um, this is just linear resistivity. This is just to point out that this is actually a small gap semiconductor. The gap here is about 1,000 Kelvin, about a tenth of an EV. Um, so the uh, linear resistivity is, is, is insulated and not very. Um, if you try very hard and produce an aligned film, so that the stripes are going in a particular direction. That's a particular in the red direction rather than the blue direction. So this is a diffraction spot. And you measure the field-dependent resistance. What you get is something which is very nonlinear uh, in one direction and not in the other. And furthermore, generates a large amount of noise at very low frequencies associated with the motion in one direction rather than the other that might be and there's some debate about this, but you know, might well be associated with what's called sliding of the whole density wave modulation. So it, it's, I mean, uh, I, you know, undoubtedly there are odd effects. The frequency scale you probably can't see here. We're talking about frequencies which are in the kilohertz range um, and relatively low uh, voltages um, of the order of, uh, of the order of volts or, or tens of volts per centimeter, uh, not kilovolts. Not the kind of uh, voltages that, that, that one talks about uh, applying to other things. Now, I talked about two sets of structures. There's this, there's these incommensurate phases. One can also get well known in these systems what one might call disordered textured phases, which are beyond these. Um, and they're well known. <coughs> um, uh, you can. Um, change the proportion of these two phases, the external conditions, strain, temperature, magnetic field, current, illumination. It's very difficult to do this in a controlled fashion, but it's being done. Okay. Um, why are these things stable, and why are they stable so far? One of the things I do want to point out, which is very important, as I showed you, these things are ferroelastic. If you change the strain conditions, you move the order parameters now, and that produces um, uh, coexistence phenomena all by itself familiar to all material scientists in terms of tweed. Right? And the point there is that if you have a free energy as a function of some order parameter, which has a couple of minima, so this is going to have a first order transition from this one to that one, 
And if this is the free energy of the system where the strain has accommodated, this is the ground state. If you clamp the system, however, if you freeze it, um, as you would be if you took a nucleus inside an otherwise untransformed sample, the, you have an extra elastic energy cost which would be clamped, which, for example, could bring this minimum above that one. So this nucleus would not be stable and would not grow. It, however, can grow only if its neighbor has a nucleus which is oriented the other way so that their strain fields cancel out. So when you make a transformation in a Martin system <coughs> material like this, you tend to get nuclei which appear which have orientations which are different. Unfortunately, they're also incompatible. If these domains try to grow, um, they will grow. This one atom has to be the same as that one, and it can't do that. So the domains tend to grow up to a point, and then they get stuck. And you either get particular patterns of elastic compatibility where the domains can line up, or you get mixed phases which are produced by kinetic reasons by these, uh, by these strain domains. And then what happens is that if you change the external parameters of the system, what you end up doing is you end up changing the relative proportions of these two phases, but you always end up in a situation where you have two phases over a wide variation. Um, and um, that's a well-known effect uh, to, uh, to material scientists, particularly in Martin City, <coughs> it's the origin of shape memory levels, for example. So it's not anything new, and we have that here as well. Um, so, you know, it, uh, and, and this leads to interesting things colossal piezo conductivity, actually, you can get out of these materials of various uh, things. And you know, the sense of all of these, by the way, if there was ever a uh, um, a real method of actually controlling carefully the properties of these materials, they could be very useful. The people have been working on it for a while, and it's turned out to be very hard. Um, I have a couple more vignettes. Um, that is a particular example of what one might join up with the vein of, of, of what tends to get called quantum critical phenomena, which is a, a, a fancy way of saying a low temperature phase transition from one phase to another. Um, and you know, we've got used to the idea that, that quantum critical phenomena are not only interesting, but there are hard, actually quite a lot of very interesting um, systems we have. I've got a few up here. Um, here's uranium, germanium 2. This is a uh, material which has ferromagnetism with superconductivity in the boundary of it. Uh, the cuprates are much discussed. I particularly like this phase diagram that comes from a colleague of mine mostly because it explains how well we understand these. You can't read this from the back. But after 20 years of work, we've labeled these phases very strange metal, less strange metal, pseudo gap region, and messy incident. And that is about the level of uh, theoretical understanding of these things, and the experiments have moved on a pace, but the theory's not doing so well. Um, uh, here's one of my favorites. This is uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. This is a material which at zero field has a transition into a state which opens up a gap um, at about 17 Kelvin. You can suppress that transition in the field. It comes down here. And when you get down here, you discover there's this plethora of phases and phase boundaries and lines and stuff which appear uh, at that critical point. There seems to be something um, odd about critical phenomena. In fact, you know, nature doesn't seem to like them. So here's an example of one which has also been a, a bit of a conundrum, serum carbolidium 5. Um, this is a superconductor, um, uh, interesting D-wave superconductor at a temperature of a, of a couple of Kelvin or so. Um, in a, it's a type 2 superconductor and in a magnetic field, the transition temperature drops, this is C2, down to zero. Um, the interesting thing that happens is that in the vicinity of this boundary here, um, a new phase was seen. Um, and the phase boundary was discovered by a variety of means. It was originally suggested to be full to full out. Um, uh, but it turns out on closer inspection, it's not really. It's a spin density. In fact, in this phase, which is called Q phase, there is a spin density modulation, as well as being superconductor. Now, the odd thing about this is that this is not sort of some boundary which extends out the other side. Up here, it seems to be a perfectly normal, or maybe not normal, 
but sort of quantum critical system. This phase exists only inside the superconductor. Um, uh, and the magnetic order seems to be tied to it being superconducting very near C2. Okay. Um, now, again, in, in systems like this, without getting into much of the microscopics, people are not surprised to see competing antiferromagnetism at all spin density wave and singlet D-wave superconductivity. That's a, something we've got used to. There are reasons to believe that they might be coming together. Um, uh, so models would do that, and, and not, not surprising. Um, but the first thing I want to point out that actually, if you happen to have both of them together, as a result of the coupled symmetries, you actually automatically generate a third order and the third order parameter will be something that used to be called Eden Perry, that you remember, um, uh, which is a triplet pairing which is periodically modulated with a wave vector of superconductivity. Um, now, um, so you know, let's go back and take some brainless model and try and model this. So, what is the brainless model? The model is to do some kind of BCS beam field with all of these three order parameters, and here it is. It's not very uh, Innovating really, but there are three order parameters. There's magnetization, there's one kind of pairing, there's the other kind of pairing. I can sort of solve this. And, uh, but the point I want to make is that the structure of these equations is that it takes one order parameter, has a pairing potential, and couples it back to itself. This is a self consistent equation. But however, generically, these things couple and they couple in the way that one order parameter couples quadratically to the other two. So order parameter one couples to two and three. What that means is that the only solutions that you're allowed to get out of this equation are as follows. You can have no order parameters at all. You can have one of them, or you can have three. Um, and if you take that uh, structure and you apply that model to a particular model, this is in fact what you get. So I put in just some pairing parameters, again, a little bit of tuning, but not too much. You indeed get D-wave signal because that's what we put in. When you get close to the HD2, you get an induced three-phase thing, which is more stable than all of them. And then actually you have a first order boundary, a weak first order boundary to nothing at all. And so this is another way of looking at that. You go from one phase to three phases to nothing. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not trying to argue, of course, for anything particular about the microscopic solution that I've done here, this is some lead field sort of ad hoc thing. But the point is that the structure of the theory forces things like this to happen automatically. Lastly, two more slides, and then I'm done. Um, this is completely different because classical physics. And one of the reasons that I got involved with thinking about mixed phases um, was problems like this. Uh, this is data from. Uh, well, actually, this data is more recent than the data from a decade ago, and in fact, historically, lots of data like this. Of the material, this is silver selenide. Um, this is a rather cruddy um, uh, uh, semiconductor. Um, and you measure the uh, uh, magnetic resistance on this curve and the Hall effect down here up to fields here of close to 60 Tesla, and you discover that there is a non saturating magnetic resistance, which is roughly linear. Um, this is an ordinary, or not particularly ordinary, but this is a semiconductor. Semiconductors don't do this. Semiconductors are supposed to have a quadratic magnetic resistance that then saturates. Um, this is clearly not a quantum effect. Um, this is all the way from 290 Kelvin down to 1.5 Kelvin. And of course, if one goes back looking in the literature before people knew how to make good materials, this is the kind of thing that was routinely seen. What is it? It's associated with classical disorder. If you take a two-component material um, and, uh, or, or, or a sort of an inhomogeneous material, which is just an inhomogeneous semiconductor, and you treat it as an array of four terminal resistors, um, and ask what does the magnetic resistance look like as a function of magnetic field, actually you get things that look like this. It doesn't saturate. The shape of these curves depend in detail on the mobility and the mobility fluctuations. It gets very linear as the material gets compensated, and that's one of the characteristics of this material. It has uh, more or less equal numbers of electrons and holes in it. It is highly disordered, 
and you get curves like this. What's actually happening in your sample is that. These are the current contacts. These arrows are the current paths. The greens are the voltages. What, of course, happens is that when you go to uh, at low fields, uh, the current follows the path of least resistance. At high fields, the current follows the path of greatest resistance. Because if there's an electric field line, and then you're in a magnetic field, and there's a Hall effect, the current will always go at an angle to the Hall effect. And so the current then takes a winding path, avoiding all of the uh, low resistance pieces of the material. And so here's that path, and the voltage drop, taking the sun from one corner to the other. And most of the time, when you put your contacts down to measure the longitudinal magnetic resistance, you'll be on either side of this current path, and you'll get this effect. It has an AC analog. Um, again, slightly discussed before, um, if you have a homogeneous material, which has both a resistance and a capacitance, this is just about the last one. Um, you normally model that by having uh, a, a circuit which is a resistor and a capacitor. In parallel, this is what it is. This is the resistor. I've written in the, the Hall effect in here. So this is what I need the resistance. All angles go into the data. Is mu h and omega c tau, and this is the dielectric function. Um, this is a rather innocuous thing. Um, if, however, you take a medium which is inhomogeneous and you start joining bits together, you end up joining resistors and capacitors in series rather than in parallel. And this is different because this is produces things which actually have an oscillator. This is well known. This is Maxwell Wagner effect, and it can generate AC resonances. Um, so let me ask, now what happens if I take a system which is actually a random composite of metal and dielectric? Um, this is the real part of the imaginary part of the dielectric function. So this is conductivity. This is dielectric function. The, 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 the axis along the bottom is, I, is, is, magne is, is magnetic field or frequency or scattering rate. All of these things could be put or be independently varied. But for different values of magnetic field, as the magnetic field gets bigger, you generate a resonance. Um, and uh, and you know, it produces a proper resonance. It looks like an inductor. There's no inductance. Um, and um, can you do that? Well, actually, here's an example of this, I think. This is just porous silicon. This is actually nanopillar silicon. It turns out actually to have, um, whoops, iron and nickel in it as well. Um, uh, but that doesn't matter because it actually does exactly the same thing if it's just for a silicon. <coughs> These different curves here are on different magnetic fields. And this again, this is the uh, um, real imaginary parts of the capacitance. So this thing lines up with that, that lines up with that. The reason the curves are swapped is the temperature is being changed in here um, at uh, fixed frequency. And therefore, you're sweeping this way in this curve. And you see produce of this awesome. So it's, um, uh, one often gets these kind of things that are rather, rather, rather familiar, um, and they can actually be uh, potentially useful. So, so um, that's my end remark. A few comments, I suppose, that we, we, we're really um, got a great propensity for finding quite critical points. Um, that, that's something that we all, all look for. Um, I think there's sort of a generalized hypothesis that sort of emerging, because whenever you look closely, most of these quantum critical points seem not really to hold up under inspection. Um, and for individual ones, one can always find a story, and it may well be that there's a sort of a generalized result of uh, pneumatics and the typical way of energy choices. The problem with sorting this all out is that there is a lot of work on high profile systems and very little work looking at model systems that you can hope to understand very well. And I think a lot of the interesting properties that we get of these materials is potentially associated with these self-organizing phenomena into kind of self-organized metamaterials. And if we could actually find a way of really controlling it in an engineering sense, um, it might turn out to be something like that. So, thank you.
this, this is just silicon. Uh, on, the, on the left side. On the left side. So, on the left side. So, actually, so, so this is, so I'm sorry, so the system which is being modeled there, it turns out that, that, that this is a, a two dimensional system, an equal proportion of a dielectric and a conductor. And so, it's, well, it's, because it is exactly at percolation, I can solve that exactly. So this is so this is a particular situation where um, I'm actually at percolation. So at percolation, there is a duality relation. You can solve it exactly. If you go away from that, you can do mean field things, and it doesn't change much. <coughs> so, yeah, so this answer, so this particular answer, is derived at percolation, and therefore it depends on nothing. If I go away from percolation, there'll, there'll be other scales that appear. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in your mandate, I see you commented on, on mentioning the phase code. This is a thermic that can charge with a phase. And, and you know, this has been commented on before. What's the probability of having, say, some ordering of a ferromagnetic uh, phase and some percolation and some conduction as a result? Well, I, I, mean, I think actually that, it, that it's quite hard. So much of what you see when you're looking in the vicinity of what people call CMR. So, um, well, you may remember I sort of drew this generic phase diagram which had a first order line which ended it. Um, once, you're, you know, once you're in the regime where you're seeing first order transitions, much of what you see experimentally is then, you know, in the vicinity of that transition is percolated physics. I mean, not very different, for example, from what Dimitri discussed in the generation of VO2. You see very similar patterns which we control this. Well, I th you, you, well, of course, that, that transition temperature is happening relatively high. And so, it, so in fact, it, it is for some compositions in the vicinity of room temperature. But you know, the, the, the problem is that the words tend to get used really very loosely. Um, and there are a few systems which have been studied very carefully, and a lot of systems where things are said, but, but, but um, it, it's difficult to really back them up. Because, not surprisingly, these systems are very complicated. Everything depends in detail about uh, ionic radii and, and, and tuning in that. And I suppose one of my points about the, the effect of elastic degrees of freedom is that the effect of the coupling of the elastic degrees of freedom is such that you always tend to have a balanced mixture because of the clamping effects. So that extends the region of coexistence to be much larger than you would have expected on thermodynamic yeah. Because it's the wish for you know, the electronic Right, but but I mean, but I mean, much of that, I mean, you know, all of those phenomena exist. I, um, you know, there, there, there's a, you know, it's it's turned out to be very very difficult to control. It, it, it's, uh, you know, getting good materials, good control, good reproducibility of everything. And that, that's why. I think it's very hard. Can you go back one slide or two slides on your sigma? Okay, what, what sigma? Yeah. What, what, what am I doing here? So I'm sorry, this, this is the model that I put in. So this is so this is the, so this is the conductivity, the generalized conductivity. Well, why, why is the isometric? Oh, because of the magnetic field. And so the point is so this is sigma, so this is the whole effect. So by putting so by, again I'm talking about magneto resistance. So so I've got so it's symmetric x, x, y, y. And this is the whole effect, which, which is turned on the magnetic field. And that's the dielectric function, which I assume is here. A lot of question. In these various phenomena reported, do you ever see anything that's related to frustration? Uh, you, you mean in, in a circuit sense? Well, in, in, in the anti terror magnetic sense, the effect of frustration or contradictory. Um, well, of course, I mean, well, in the previous study, yes, because of course, the many of the antiferromagnetic phases are frustrated because we're on, because because of the ladder structures that one is on. Um, of course, the, this thing here is just circuit theory. It's nothing. Another phenomenon. I would imagine you would encounter frustration. Well, right, but I think I you know much of what I you know it turns out that antiferromagnetic interactions where they exist occur because the system is insulated. Once you've gone into insulating, then these antiferromagnetic interactions occur by a super exchange, and they're generically rather weak. 
So antiferromagnetism per se doesn't play a lot of role in the energetics. One does have a lot of complicated antiferromagnetic phases that appear. I, mean, I, I talked only about x equals a half. One can reproduce this at every rational number across that phase diagram with all different kinds of uh, magnetic structures, many of which have been understood since the 50s. Right. 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 The resonance only occurs because there's a magnetic field. Yeah. So you have induced uh, inductance. You have an induced inductance associated. So as you see, what happens is, and you, you probably can't see very much here, but all of these things which actually produce a resonance are, are, are a large beta, large omega c tau. So, so that, that's where it comes from. Yeah. It was a surprise to me too. And last question. Um, one possible by promising uh, overlap uh, between the resistive switching phenomena and what you are uh, discussing here is to look at those charged structures which you mentioned and ask not only their small signal resistivity but at larger voltages is there like a realignment? Can you move them? You made a connection to liquid crystals. Mm -hmm. uh, those charged and created structures should have some dynamics and uh, show positive switching phenomena. Well, I, I say um, one way we know you can actually do that is by applying strain. You can certainly align them, so that's what you can see. Um, as I showed you, I showed some evidence from nonlinear transport, which is disputed because it's just a resistance curve. And there are lots of ways of getting nonlinearity, although I think it's likely to be associated with nonlinear transport. So that means that the, the field is moving these things around. Right. Again, it's just very difficult to control it. You have to have a thin film, you have to have an oriented thin film, it has to be in a taxi. You know, all of those things, all of those good things, the theory is taken for granted. No, I mean, I, um, I think, you know, one of the re I mean, having said that, I don't think that this is useful. You know, if one could get control of these materials in that way, those are the kind of things that would be very nice to play with. But it's, um, and, and, and generically, this is room temperature physics. Okay, thank you very much.